Good evening, everyone. Model Man Frank here. How are you today? See, I can see now that I do have sound. Last week, we had some sound difficulties, and I had to change computers. I have two frames in front of me. I have this one and this one, as you can see in the reflection of my eyeglasses. Um, haven't seen many people join in, but we'll go ahead and continue. If you're watching the video on playback, uh, please like and subscribe the video and share it out with everybody. Um, and uh, just remember, every Sunday night at 7.30 p.m., we are right here on this station. I've done the research, and I'm the only one that kind of does things like this, that uh, we talk about airplanes. And we talk about some of the planes that I do here in the shop and some of the fun projects that you can do and a little bit of the history of aviation in general. Um, tonight's program is going to be not only about some of the things that I'm working on in the shop, but we're also going to talk about the, the Havilland Corporation. Every aircraft that uh, I'm going to talk about in this podcast, you can build models of them, uh, whether it be plastic, 3D printed, or you can also uh, make them into remote control airplanes. Uh, anything that's remote control, I'll put a link in the description box below so you can follow to Outer Zone, which is a database website that has a list of plans. You can type in a company uh, from the past and you'll be able to find a, a whole bunch of plans. And if you don't have the means to print those plans out, you can go to eBay. There's a couple of guys out there on eBay that they have plans for those aircraft in different sizes and they can print them out for you and you can buy them for a certain price. It's probably going to be about the same amount of you were taking it to a print shop. So I'll put those links in the description box below down there. Not down here, down here, but you, you know what I'm talking about. So tonight, uh, just a little heads up of what's going on in aviation world. Not much. Uh, I hear Boeing is still having issues. Airbus is still cranking out airplanes. And uh, we're, you know, we're still in the in the aviation field. It's it's still going a day by day situation. Um, model airplane wise, um, didn't do much flying. I'm actually waiting. I, I did some flying with my uh, jet last week. And I had a problem. Um, I, pr I think I spoke about it where I had a, uh, a little issue where I landed and folded the landing gear and I had to fix it. Um, as you can see over my shoulder here, actually, I'm sorry, this side, I'm working on the Liberty Sport and a couple of airplanes. Um, you can probably see back there over, oh, sorry, on this side is the pipe uh, club cub. I got the engine mounted, and I'm going to show a video of me doing that. When I get a chance, I'll give you guys a little bit of a heads up and make a video on it also. Um, tonight's program is a little bit... Uh, so we're going to talk about the Haviland Aviation. Um, the Haviland Aviation has been around for a while. Um, they started off in the 1900s. Um, Jeffrey... His name was Joffrey uh, de Havilland, and Joffrey de Havilland was a designer. He built airplanes, you know, like many of the designers, they started out, you know, they did scribblings and things like that. His very first aircraft that he designed and sold off to an aircraft as an aircraft was in the 19, like 1909. Um, it was actually sold off as an airship and then later on in 1920s he started his own company and started producing aircraft uh with the help of the british government um all the way up until uh, the 1980s slash 90s the Havilland aircraft corporation was in business they built some really great aircraft um, the Pussmoth, the Havilland Pussmoth, which I have over here, um, 
which is this model right here, is one of the aircraft that he built. He actually designed the plane, and he came out with other subsequent designs after that. The Dragon Rapide, which uh, the De Havilland Rapide and the De Havilland Dragon uh, were two aircraft that he built. They were um, almost in the same range as the Beach 18, um, kind of like a passenger-style, corporate-style aircraft. Uh, it was a biplane, but a very revolutionary wing design that was almost like a dragon, like a, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a dragonfly. If you look at the wings, the wings are very thin, and the engines in the cells sit below them, and the body looks like a dragon, uh, dragonfly. Um, it had fixed landing gear, and it was a pretty fast little airplane for a single uh, single pilot in the front. Um one of the very first aircraft that the Haviland made was called the DH-16. And where I'm getting this information is from a book. Something I've talked about on this, pro on this program all the time is books are important. You have to have books. Uh, books have a, a wealth of information, and you can get better information than you can from the Internet. On the Internet, you're going to go through... If you go to Wikipedia, it, it's going to go a little bit too technical for you, and you're going to you're you're going to unless you're technical based, you're not really going to get it. But if you just want to read a little bit about the history of about it, books are just as good. Uh, I'm going to show you the book that I have here. Um, I got this one pretty long time ago. That is correct. Pusmoth speed was 128 miles an hour. This is one of the books I have here. And um, you can get these books on eBay. Um, old bookstores have the uh, bookshops. Uh, old bookshops. I'm sorry. Old bookshops. <laughs> old bookstores have uh, these books available in their, in their plenty of libraries. Just go into an old bookstore and hey, tell them, hey, listen, I'm looking for an airplane, any airplane books. And they'll send you over to the the the, the area where they could find them. Um, in town here, we have an old uh, bookstore that's very very good, and uh, she has a wealth of information. And I found some really cool books in there. Uh, every time I go in there, I find something new, and so does my wife. Uh, she doesn't read airplane books, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, so the Havlin. Um, started off with the DH-16, which was one of his planes. He uh, he continued on, and he built the DH-18. But one of the ones that is the most viewed, and a lot of people don't know too much about it, was the Haviland, the Gypsy Moth, the Tiger Moth. Here's the funny thing about the Puss Moth. Yes, Roadmap to reality. Uh, Puss Moth had a top speed of 128 miles an hour. But something that's not really told about the Puss Moth. The Puss Moth broke a lot of records. Um, there was quite a number of people that flew it um, long distances. Um, in my book here. Uh, I'm going to read you a little excerpt. During uh, July 1931, Amy Johnson used her plane called Jason 2 to fly from Limpney to Tokyo. That's a long flight. Uh, eight hours, 22, I'm sorry, eight days, 22 hours, 35 minutes. And in 1932, Jim Mollison, Mollison, sorry, flew from Lipney in the UK. Lipney is in the UK to Cape Town. Four days, 17 hours, and 19 minutes. At a plant with, with a plane that had a hot top speed of 128 miles an hour. Not bad, huh? The Gypsy Moth was, was a unique aircraft. It was a two to three seater. So it was one passenger in the front, two passengers in the back. So it was a three seater aircraft. Or you could put two passengers in it. Didn't matter. It had double doors. Basically, one that opened up like this. 
and the passenger in the back could get in and easily in and out. Um, the power plant on the aircraft was 120 horsepower Gypsy 3 inline piston engine. The engine was actually sit positioned upside down. So the pistons were on the bottom while the crankshaft was on top. So it would actually, so since the plane was sitting on the ground, you could actually see over the cowling. Um, if you know what is a lot of twin engine aircraft, when they, when they're taxiing, they do the fishtail. This one, you didn't have to fishtail because you were able to see around the cowling a little bit. bit. He thought about those things when he was designing the plane. Uh, the plane sits pretty low to the ground. The pit, the muffler, instead of coming out on the bottom, it actually goes below the the uh, cabin and actually comes out through the tail. I'll show you a picture of the aircraft in just a moment. Um, service ceiling on the plane was the the actual weight of the aircraft was 1,200 pounds. That was a gross weight. Um, tack maximum takeoff weight, it was 2,000 2, pounds. I'm sorry. Um, the wingspan was 36 feet. Uh, the length of the plane was 25 feet and the height of the aircraft was seven feet. And that was at its tail. Um, all of the Havilland's airplanes, including the Gypsy Moth, the Tiger Moth and the Puss Moth and some of the other aircraft, all had that signature tail where it came up like this and then rotated around. And it had, they all had that same kind of look. That was a selling look, you know? Anybody saw that flying by, they knew it was a de Havilland aircraft back in the day. So, you know, and, and the, the sound of the motors. This particular aircraft was built in the 1920s. And most aircraft back then that were built in the 1920s were built with wooden fuselage. This one had welded steel, which is very rare back in that time. So it made the aircraft pretty expensive. Um, I would I would think that this aircraft had, this was pretty much the Cirrus, uh, the SR-22 of the time. So... 259 of these aircraft were built. Um, later on, there were another 25 of them that were built in Canada. So the Havilland Corporation was based in the UK, but they had other companies franchised out. So the Havilland Canada built aircraft, and then you had the Havilland uh, Australia, which would also... Uh, uh, supply aircraft to other British royalties in the Pacific, including Hong Kong and uh, lower Southeast Asia and uh, New Zealand. Um, also, the Indians, the Indian area also. Let me show you what the Puss Moth actually looked like. It's a pretty heavy book, but here's the Puss Moth right here. It's a pretty cool looking airplane. Can't wait to finish it up. I think it'll look really pretty when I when I put the two-tone colors on it. The next aircraft that the Havilland built, these so the Puss Moth was actually a civilian aircraft. It wasn't really a military style plane. Um, the next aircraft next to the Puss Moth, which was a civilian tile style aircraft, was the Leopard Moth. It was an upgrade to the Puss Moth. It was introduced in 1933, and it was also a three-seater touring aircraft. Um, it actually competed in a King's Race, King's Cup race at Hatfield, and this aircraft almost the same. Wingspan was 37 feet, uh, length was 24 feet, and the height at the tail was eight feet. So the tail was a little. It did not, it didn't really have that signature look of the, but it came close. Very, um, one plane that was, that the Avalon made that was very popular and it survived from just after World War II all the way up to, um, jump, sorry, it was introduced right after World War I and survived throughout World War II. It was used as a trainer 
was the Tiger Moth. Everybody knows what the Tiger Moth looked like. Um, it was a great little airplane. It had the same gypsy um, motor in it. It had gypsy major one seat inline engine, which was rotated upside down. Most of de Havilland's biplanes and planes at that time period all had the crankcase on top with pistons on the bottom. So it, it, it made for a little bit easier aircraft. So when you were uh, looking out over the cowling, you're, you were able to be seen. You were able to see what you were doing. Um, I had a, I had a tiger moth here as an RC plane. There's a couple of videos I have of it flying. Um, I actually, that plane was given to me by a very good friend of mine at my model airplane field. And I ended up passing it on to somebody else that would have a little bit more enjoyment. It had been sitting on my rack here for a while and I passed it on to a friend of mine at the club. And now it's going to live on and being flown by somebody else. Um, eventually I'll maybe build one. But uh, right now, no, I'm, I'm, I got so many other things that I'm building. I want to finish that uh, Liberty Sport and, of course, the Club Cup. Um, the Tiger Moth was built in many. It was it was there was many of the aircraft that were built. There were, you know, close to almost 2000 airplanes built. Um, it was a wood construction over canvas and the plane uh, trained so many pilots especially World War II pilots that went on to fly Spitfires. And one of the other planes that the Havilland created, which was the Mosquito. Um, if you haven't seen what I'm talking about in terms of the Tiger Moth, I'll show you another photo here. This is a very large book. I do apologize. I don't have really cool graphics to show you online, but that's the, gyps that's the uh, Tiger Moth right there. Really cool looking airplane. It's got that signature tail on it, and so does the Dragon Rapide, which is on the next page, which is right over here. And that is that signature tail that was with the planes. Um, the De Havilland uh, Tiger Moth was a DH-82. De Havilland built... The DH-82, which was the Tiger Moth, and also built the Moth, which was, there was a Moth aircraft. Had a different style engine. It was a little bit slower. It didn't last very long. It did fly up until the 1930s as a trainer, and then the Tiger Moth took over its place. Um, the Dragon, the De Havilland Dragon was a unique aircraft was another aircraft that the Havilland designed. It was a two plane, had two motors. Um, there was the Dragon, and then there was the Dragonfly. The Dragonfly was the same plane, a little bit bigger horsepower, a little bit more horsepower, and um, a very unique wing. Um they were known as the Rapide and the Dominite and the Dragonfly. The Dragonfly was a light transport aircraft where the Dragonfly was, uh, I'm sorry, the Dragon Rapide was a, a little bit heavier transport aircraft. It carried a little bit more people on it. So where the light transport was like maybe six people. Um, the Dragon Rapide was 10. So you had the two pilots and then you had your passengers. So, um, also the engine performance on that aircraft on the Dragon Rapide was 150 miles per hour top speed. So for a light transport aircraft, that's a pretty, pretty good, uh, uh, flying, uh, aircraft. Um, at one point in the 1930s, uh, uh, De Havilland also built a four-engine version of the Dragon Rapide. There were not that many built. Um, it was just, uh, it was, it was really not a, it wasn't a mass-produced aircraft. Let's say uh, people were, as the war was starting to uh, ramp up. They started moving away from biplanes and they started moving into fighter aircraft. 
and fighter production. The the H-87 Moth Hornet was uh, Hornet Moth was another aircraft that was built. It went down the basis of the Puss Moth and the other aircraft that I had just spoken about. I'm so sorry, the Leopard Moth. Um, also a two seating touring aircraft. That one was just two seat, not three seats like the other two aircraft. Um, same length of wingspan, same around the same or around the same miles per hour, a little bit less uh, by two miles. One aircraft that actually competed in the Thompson Trophy and the races from Paris to, uh, for it was a racing aircraft, was the DH-88 Comet. The Havilland built an airplane to race, and it was a transcontinental racer. It raced from England, I believe, all the way down to it raced in the Sudan. So it was a race plane. Um, it's their plane. The plane was actually built with a very thin wing, like the Dragon and the Domine. The Domine. Sorry, if my name pronunciation is off, I do apologize. Um, it was the H DH eighty eight Comet. It was a two seat race racer mail plane okay um it was the victorian centennial air race from middle hall to melbourne australia um this aircraft was built in 1934 for that race uh maximum speed was 237 miles an hour it had a retractable landing gear and it was very it was streamlined for speed it had that signature tail that the Havilland had come so famous with the nose of the aircraft had a light so looked like a tuck a torpedo with that look like that bolt that uh torpedo light in the front right um hubert broad first the uh, flew the first comment then intended for Mollison and Hatfield on 8 December 1935, 1934, sorry. Its certificate of airworthiness was issued on the 9th of October and certificates for the other two aircraft. So there were a total of three aircraft that were built. This plane wasn't mass produced. It was just used for, for a it was a racing demonstrator. It just demonstrated the, the, the technological advances for that time with retractable landing gear and streamlining, uh, streamlining the aircraft. Um, I don't think there's any, any surviving planes of this aircraft. Um, I, I have to take a look um, and see which museums, but you can build a model of this aircraft. Um, flight test decided to build one and it kind of like looks like it, but you'd have to make the wing like it. Um, this would be a plain, pretty cool plane to make out of foam board and to reproduce. Um, so the Havilland, so World War II was coming. This was the 1930s. The DH com, DH-88 Comet was out. And this was really, you know, we're, we're ramping up into World War II. World War II started in the 1930s. 1938-39 is when Hitler invaded Poland. And was marching, the Third Reich was marching towards England. Um, in 1939, when that happened, uh, Britain entered the war and the Battle of Britain started. There were pilots needed to fly the Spitfire. Because the Spitfire was just coming on the scene, just as the HE-111s and the ME-109s were starting to strafe airfields. The Hawker Hurricane was the aircraft of choice. It wasn't a great fighter plane, could take a beating, but it just it was out of its league. The Spitfire entered with the Merlin motor, with the Merlin engine, and everything changed. Um, most of the Spitfires that were built and most of the aircraft that were built during the war were a combination of wood and aluminum. 
since there was a short of aluminum shortage of aluminum in the UK and the UK was relying on the aluminum brought in from the United States and its other partners. There was a shortage, so they used wood on some of these aircraft. The Haviland saw that they needed a faster fighter bomber. He designed a marvelous aircraft called <laughs> the DH-98 Mosquito. Mosquito had that kind of signature tail, but it had something that no other aircraft at the time had. Two Merlin engines basically had two Spitfires powering this plane. It was also known as the Wooden Wonder. The aircraft was completely built out of wood. There was very small percentage of aluminum in the aircraft and steel tubing. Uh, of course, the engine mounts were steel and aluminum. And there was the steel engine also, the big Merlin engines. Um, top speed for the Mer for the mosquitoes. Sorry, got to go to the next page. So the aircraft had two twelve oh. I'm sorry, one thousand six hundred and twenty horsepower Rolls Royce Merlin twenty five piston engines. Top speed was 362 miles an hour. There's a great story um, on uh, mostly used by the Royal Air Force. That is correct. Uh, Royal Air Force, Canadian Air Force, they all use the aircraft. Thank you, Roadmap to Reality. Um, one of the greatest, There was. A, there's a really cool story. So uh, the... The Mosquito was used as a fighter, a bomber, and a photograph aircraft. Um, I was watching how it was created and everything like that. Back in the 1990s, they used to have this TV show called Discovery Wings, and they actually talked to the pilots that flew these planes. And uh, Germany had the jet bombers already out, which was the Arado 223, I think it was, or 234. And... It was most of the missions that were done by the military uh, at the time. The Brits would always fly at nighttime. It was the best time to fly. If you flew in a full moon, you could fly into an area and really not be seen. Um, but they would use searchlights to kind of call uh, the Germans would use searchlights to find you. And then they would start shooting barrages of, of uh, anti anti-aircraft fire into the air, which was flak. Um, you're in your Mer in your Merlin-powered Mosquito, which is stripped down of guns. You don't have any guns on the plane, and you're flying with your navigator. So you fly in, you take pictures, and you fly back out. Well, the Germans were doing the same thing, but they were flying their jet bombers, which was the Arado. The Arado was a twin-engine jet bomber, which will take up the jet bombers in another uh, conversation later on. But Arata was building, banging out these jet planes and they were, they, they would have bomber versions and, but they mostly use them for photo photography. Um, so flying mosquitoes flying along and looks over and there's an Arata going this way. Since they didn't have any guns, all they could do was hi <laughs> as the guy flew this way and he's flying that way. And the bomber, the pilot even said it. He says, we didn't have any guns to fire at each other. So we would just wave at each other as we flew by. Because he was going to take pictures of, you know, a target in England. And I was going to take pictures of a target in his homeland. So, you know, we just kind of like waved at each other and just said hello to each other. Not bad for a, pri yeah, it was a plane, but it was a wooden aircraft. So, you know, the plane would fly by at 400 miles an hour. And then you had the Arado flying by at, you know, almost the same speed, maybe even faster. Um, and they just waved at each other. Um, 
the plane was undertaken, was used in many different low-level missions. It was a low-level fire fighter plane. Rarely did they fly high in. Uh, they would fly high altitude when they were going into a, an area, and they would they they would come down, and it was a low-level fighter plane. It really did low well, low level. Um, there were many different variations of the Mosquito. There was the glass nose, which was the bomber version. Uh, that would be two pilots and a bombardier. So it'd be three, pa a three, uh, a crew of three. And then, um, actually, I'm sorry, it was a crew of two. So it was always a crew of two. You had your, your navigator who was your bombardier and he would crawl underneath the cockpit into the bottom bay area. And then he would drop the bombs. It wasn't like the Douglas uh, A-20 Havoc or the B-26 at the time, which was a three-crew. three, three, uh, uh, three crew. The Mosquito was only two. So it was your pilot, your navigator, slash bomber, bombardier. Um, the, they had the Sea Mosquito, which had folding wings. And um, that was the Mark 33. The aircraft, the Mark 33 wasn't really used very much in, in, in on sea trials, uh, sea version of the aircraft. Um, from what I'm reading here, the Mark 33 was the naval reconnaissance fighter, which was called the Sea Marosquito. It was similar to, but included folding wings in an arresting gear and detail changes, little details. But I haven't read anything about any of the combat that the sea mosquito really did. Um, it could carry a torpedo, but so could the regular mosquito, which was uh, the Mark 20, the Mark 26. Um, the mosquito was a bomber, like I said, a photo reconnaissance aircraft, a fighter plane. It had Browning machine guns in the front, and it was also a you could drop a huge bomb out of it. Um, if you ever have a chance to get a, uh, an afternoon, you want to watch some movie or late at night, look for Squadron 633 uh, with Robert Taylor, I think it is. And you can watch the movie, and it's an old movie. Uh, you know, it's got this love thing going on there, but it's got some really cool flying scenes, all with models, some of the greatest stuff you see in the world. I love some of the models that they use. They, they blow them up and it looks like a little firecracker. <laughs> you know, you see the plane fall apart in little places. But it's uh, based on some stories. Um, the Mosquitoes also did a raid on a base where prisoners of war were. They actually used the plane to bomb the war camp. They blew up the wall and all the prisoners of war got out. And some got recaptured, but they helped. It was called a great raid, and uh, they were they were used in that uh, exploited war. Um, after the war, the Haviland, just like everybody else, was going to jet powered, and they broke out and developed the DH Vampire, the Haviland Vampire. Really cool little airplane. Um, it had a fusel a center fuselage with one engine, and it was the Whittle engine, which was ge later General Electric. And it was uh, the power plant was a the Havlin Goblin three turbojet, which were loud. Um, it had a twin boom tail, which had the distinctive tail, and it just was a really fascinating aircraft because it was basically a wing with twin boom tail and the engine in the center. Uh, the tail was set high, of course, so the engine wouldn't burn the tail off. But there were a lot built. Um, some of them were still in use. <laughs> Get this until 1990. So um after that, then came the uh, DH-103 Hornet, the Sea Hornet. Um, it was basically an updated version of the, uh, the Havilah Mosquito. And the Havilah Mosquito came out, and then the DH-C Hornet and regular Hornet came out, which was DH-103. 
it was a single seat dual engine piston aircraft. It was the fastest piston aircraft that the Havilland built at the time. Uh, it was a dual engine single fighter piston aircraft. Uh, performance was 472 miles an hour with a Merlin engine. It had a Merlin Rolls Royce 103 131, 2070 horsepower. That's a big engine, that's a lot of power, man. But of course, you know, you can only do so much power in a piston aircraft, so we were already they had already maxed out these engines, so they had to go to jets. I mean, with a jet aircraft, you can go 548 miles per hour, and that was the speed on the on the uh, on the Vampire. So, the Hornet only lasted up until the Mark 22. There were 43 of those aircraft built, and from 1947 to 19 late 1955, the aircraft was in production and was used. The armament on the Sea Hornets was 20 millimeter guns in the nose, plus rockets on the underside wings. So, De Havilland wanted to be wanted Britain to be the very first country to have an airliner. They came out, they were the very first to come out with a jet airliner, jet powered. Do you know which aircraft that was? It was the DH 106 Comet, was the very first passenger pressurized cabin airliner. The only problem was the aircraft had a flaw. I'm getting to that in just a moment. The DH 88. I'm sorry, the DH-106 Comet was powered by four Rolls-Royce Avon 424 turbojets and had a top speed of 503 miles per hour. Its cruising altitude was 42,000 feet. So it was a pressurized cabin, but there was a fatal flaw. When the 707 came out, if you look on modern jet aircraft, passenger airlines, the windows are round. The DH-88 Comet came out with square windows, and they were very large. De Havilland thought that if they made square windows and very big, people could be able to see all the beautiful scenery down below. That was a bad dis design decision. There were quite a number of different crashes that happened with the de Havilland Comet grounding the fleet. And subsequently, the plane wasn't making money. Uh, in the 1950s, when the aircraft came out, uh, in 1953, there was a co Comet crash. Uh, 1954, there was another crash. And then they grounded the fleet. Um, BOAC was one of their largest, uh, customers. They demanded answers. What was going on? These planes were breaking up in flight. Many people were dying. So Britain's version of the national transportation safety board, um, they couldn't find anything. They didn't know what was going wrong. So they devised a plan. They built a water tank a very large water tank, and they took a DH-106, and they put it inside this water tank. They had the wings sitting outside. They sealed the water tank, and then they ran the plane through pressurizations. And as they went through pressurization cycles, it was only a couple of cycles that they did. The pressure of the water acted like the pressure in the air. As the pressurization inside increased and decreased, something happened. A tear opened up and water rushed in and they found out what happened. So what was going on? Square window, okay, 
basically angled window, not with corners or anything like that, had developed spider cracks. And those spider cracks had started to grow as the aircraft went through pressurization cycles. You're flying at 42,000 feet. You're at pressure that's ground level. The aircraft is basically one cylindrical tube. As the pressure builds, cracks start to form. So as it went through its pressurization cycle, the cracks formed, subsequently failed of the pressure vessel, and the aircraft would just blow apart, killing everybody on board. So God be with those plant those those souls that died. Um the aircraft came back to service when de Havilland reintroduced the 106 Comet. They had redesigned the aircraft with round windows. The damage was already done. The DH-88, the DH-106, I'm sorry, I don't know why I say to keep the DH-88, but it's in my brain. Uh, the 106, the Comet, the damage was done. It didn't really do too well. The 4B, they had a couple of other versions. They stretched the fuselage. They made it carry more people. Um, many different companies used it, Middle Eastern Airlines. Uh, the Americans, the Pan Am. Pan Am was going to buy the aircraft. They decided against it once the that whole situation was happening. They canceled their orders. and uh, But the aircraft found a new purpose in life. It became a maritime patrol aircraft. Um, it became the uh, the Nimrod, and all the prototypes were converted into Nimrods, and then so subsequently, the prototypes were control uh, converted into Nimrods, and so were some passenger versions. They were converted to Nimrods, and the Nimrod flew all the way up until the year two thousand, right? uh, year two thousand when the millennial. When the millennium changed up to 2000, 2001, 2003 is when the plane aircraft flew. Um, it flew in uh, in the Falklands War. It flew in the every maritime action that Great Britain. It even flew, I'm sorry, in the Gulf War. Um, some were actually flying with harp with uh, sidewinder missiles on them to defend themselves. Um have to find out the story behind one of those because i i saw a picture of one with a sidewinder i couldn't figure out why somebody had told me the story once that you know it was there for protection i don't know i i need to find i need to look into that um i'll try and get you guys some more information about that uh on next month next week's episode we'll probably uh, touch base on the nimrod and uh and talk about that um the Havilland was still going strong and developing fighter aircraft. One was the DH-08, which ended up crashing in. It was a. Uh, uh, it had a Goblin three turbo engine and top speed was 640 miles per hour. It was a Vulcan. It was basically a small version of the Vulcan bomber. It was a single wing Delta wing. Um, the aircraft actually ended up crashing in the Thames estuary. Um, it was the only prototype and it was in, on February 15th, 1950. It was a closed circuit speed record, 605 miles an hour. And then the aircraft started to break apart. Uh, there's no real, I don't know if the pilot survived or not. There's not that much information on it. Later aircraft came out was the de Havilland 110 Sea Vixen. Um, this was a radical design aircraft, and I'm going to show you a picture of it again with the big book. This is the Sea Vixen right here. On this page, you can see the comet, but that's the Sea Vixen. Aircraft was very unique, very unoriginal design. Um, the pilot sat off to the side. So instead of like on a normal fighter plane, you're sitting straight in front of the airplane, in front of the nose, and your wheel is below you. 
the pilot sat off to one side and then your navigator sat next to you in like a little cubby hole. He didn't really have a window. Um, the aircraft flew from 19, it entered service in 1963 and finally was decommissioned in 1972. Um, it had two, um, and jet engines in it. They were Avro Rolls Royce 208 turbo jets. Max speed was 690 miles an hour. Um, when De Havilland came out with the aircraft, they wanted to develop a Mach 1 fighter. Uh, this came close. Uh, it didn't have uh, full Mark 1 capabilities, but it got pretty close. Um, max uh, dimensions. Um, max takeoff weight was 41,000 pounds. You could carry rockets, bombs. It was a fighter plane. It was uh, it was a really cool fighter plane. This was a revolutionary design. It had twin boom wing. And um, if you ever want to build a model of it, there's a couple of plastic model companies that actually build uh, that have this plane, including Aerofix. Really cool looking plane. Had folding wings. I actually built a model of one of these and painted it up and everything like that. It's sad that the plane didn't do really well militarily wise um, from what performance it had. It really, if it had gotten into a dogfight, I think a MiG-17 would have shot it down really quickly. Um, but it was a sense of pride that, you know, the Havilland had. And it was, a, they were an aircraft manufacturer for the UK. Um, the next aircraft was the Venom. And later on, one aircraft that the Havilland built that was a unique aircraft and it's lasted all the way up until now. We're going to touch base on that one right now. And you know which one I'm talking about. Harrison Ford has one. Everybody knows who Harrison Ford is, Mr. Han Solo himself. Indiana Jones, dude. The De Havilland Canada... DHC2 Beaver. The Havilland Beaver came out in 1946. And to this day, they're still flying it. It flies everything in and out of Canada, in and out of Alaska, all over Seattle. You see them flying in and out, going into the hills. Um, if you fly up to Alaska, you're going to probably end up taking one if you're going into the far reaches of Alaska to go hunting. Um, there are videos of this aircraft taking off with other radial engines sitting in the back of the plane. Um, the CIA used the aircraft in uh, military operations in, uh, in Southeast Asia during Vietnam. Uh, the Americans bought it, and they used it as a liaison aircraft. Um, this plane was basically a dump truck with wings. This plane could carry everything. Um, if you've ever watched the movie, there's a really good movie called Never Cry Wolf. It was developed. It was made in the 1980s. I always liked the movie. It was a very pretty movie to watch. In the beginning of the movie, uh, 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 the pilot that takes the char the main character out into Canada's woods to study wolves and their migratory patterns. He takes, he loads a boat, beer, all sorts of stuff, and all the supplies inside this plane. And this plane looks like it's falling apart. And literally, and it is a DH, it is a de Havilland Beaver that's flying through the air. Um, yeah, the DH Beaver. It was a beaver, exactly. Uh, the plane was a V-stall aircraft. It was a very short takeoff landing aircraft. It was a seaplane. Later on, um, there was a company in the 1980, late 1980s, early 1990s that started modifying the aircraft from radial engine to turboprop. They put a PT-6 motor on it and made it even better. So... The aircraft was, there's also the the DHC-3 Otter that came out, 
which was the stretch version of the beaver. Um, it was a stretch version, and also the body was a little wider. Um, there's actually a video. I think if you look on around on YouTube, I'll see if I can find it and put it all, I'll put it in the link in the description box below. If I do find it of a beaver taking off and it's got a motorcycle attached to the wing, the guy slang slung a motorcycle to the underside of the wing and he's flying through the air with the motorcycle. It's a, uh, I mean, they've taken ATVs on board this plane. It is a great plane. And it is one that if you ever get to see one at an air show, Take a ton of pictures. Ask the pilot a lot of questions. It is it is one that you really. I think this aircraft will be flying well off into for another 50, 60 years. It's like the B fifty two. It'll be around forever. Um, the Otter, the DH three Otter, was a bigger aircraft. It was also introduced in the nineteen forties. Um, actually, in nineteen fifty one was the very first flight. The plane was designed on the backstay of the, the Haviland uh, Beaver. And then the Haviland, since they were getting really good at building these type of aircraft, and it was the Haviland Canada. It wasn't the Haviland UK. So the Canadians were actually building these planes to be able to be short field takeoff. They came out with the DHC-4. DHC means the Haviland Canada. Uh, the 4 version was the, ca was the Caribou, also used by the CIA, also used by the Army. It was a short field takeoff aircraft that had two uh, Pratt & Whitney R2000 engines, twin radial WASP engines. The R2000 was one of the motors that was actually used on some of a lot. of uh, It was used widely used on many different aircraft. Um, I could name some, but, you know, there's just way too many airplanes to talk about. Um, there's a documentary called The Keybird. Um a rescue, a guy who goes around looking for old warbirds during the 1980s. He went into the Greenland to look for a B-29 that landed on a lake bed. They used the caribou to bring in props and engines and supplies and all that sort of stuff to fly the plane out. Um, plane ended up, well, watch the video. I'm not going to give away the ending, what happens. But just think of it this way. If the aircraft had made it, it would have been a great thing. Um, I'll put a link in the description. There's a there's a video on it here on YouTube, and I'll put a link in the description box below. The Haviland continued to build aircraft well on into the 2000s. Um, their last plane was the DHC. The Haviland Canada continued to build on planes. Um, the Haviland UK no longer, they kind of stopped. And Canada continued to build on planes. Uh, the DH the Dash Eight was the last of the, the Haviland style aircraft to come out. That ended the era of that aircraft. Uh, the aircraft was developed and built and used, and it was a cargo plane, also with a short field takeoff landing capabilities. Um, it was a twin engine boom aircraft. It had a PT six engines. They were Pratt and Whitney Canyon. Uh, PW120A prop, turbo props. The Haviland really had good things going for it. I think if they had continued and built off the success of the Beaver, they they would definitely still be around today. But a lot of the bad decisions they did on the dies, um, unless you have a really good team to continue the work, uh, things just don't happen and things don't conspire you have to have that strong team to keep you going into the next into the new future and uh, it's sad we won't see any more the Haviland aircraft coming out I think uh, it would have been great to see the company evolve over time and bring out more planes but that will never happen um, from the onset at the beginning of flight in the 1900s all the way until the 1990s, the Haviland was building some really cool planes. Um, I am going to put um, a link in the bo description box below so you can build some of these the great the Haviland airplanes. Um, and uh, I'll put a little, 
if I can find this book on eBay, I'll I'll send you guys a link. You can also go to a thrift store. Again, the name of this book is The Complete Encyclopedia of World Aircraft. It has a lot of planes. Um, Barnes & Noble Bookstore was the one that actually made the book. Uh, this was a exclusive book for them. It's got a lot of great pictures in it. Um, it's got good photos. It's got good information in it. Um, try and stay away from Wikipedia. I went on Wikipedia today to look up a another airplane that I was uh, putting out information on uh, on uh, on Facebook for 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 my group for my model airplane group uh, Avon Park Air Modelers, and some of the information in there was just weird. Um, I found all the information I needed was for a Saab Gripen. Um, I found all the information in the books. It was a lot easier. I was able to condense the core information about the plane and use it. I, I'm Wikipedia is good, you know, you know, for airplanes, but books are better. Just my opinion. Everybody may want to go onto Wikipedia and probably get a paid, you know, they have their own opinions about Wikipedia, but. Um, when it comes to finding out information about certain aircraft, either go to the manufacturer's page or don't go to Wikipedia because they use multiple sources and most of their sources may not have the right information and they'll still use it. And it's, it's, I don't know. I don't want to use the language, but it's kind of stupid. Um, on to the next. So, um, it was a good podcast tonight. I really appreciate everybody uh, uh, watching and whoever was watching. Roadmap to Reality, I appreciate you watching and uh, joining in on the conversation. Again, every Sunday night, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. Pacific. I will be putting out the previews for the next podcast around Wednesday or Thursday. I do apologize for not putting it out sooner for this one, but by Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, I'll put it on my phone to make sure that I remind myself to start putting out what we're going to be talking about on the next podcast. Um, it was a good night's podcast. If you're not a subscriber and you're watching this for the very first time, please subscribe and hit the like button. And uh, I will see you guys on the next one. Um, we will be Next week, I will bring up the information about the Nimrod. I'll put that in a, a note so I can talk more about that. Um, I didn't touch base on that one today. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more. You know what? We'll we'll delve a little bit more back into de Havilland. Uh, but this time we'll talk about the Havilland Canada. I think we need to talk a little bit more about the de Havilland Beaver, the Otter, and... Uh, the twin otter also. I think the twin otter was the one that they actually built also, which is correct. They had the twin otter and the Dash 7, which was a four-engine version of the twin otter. So there's still a little bit more here on the De Havilland side we need to talk about. So next week, De Havilland Part 2. We'll see you next time. Model Man Frank out.